Thank you very much. Well, in the beginning, uh, television, of course, wasn't possible. Campbell Swinton came up with a, a scheme, but the hardware just wasn't available to do it. And as we all know, this chap uh, was the first chap to actually produce a working television system where you had moving pictures and a grayscale. He was very keen on firsts, uh, a very good publicity uh, chap, and one of his firsts was colour television. And you see here his NIPCO disk scanner, the light source, which interrogated the source with a moving spot of light and the reflection from the uh, victim, if you like, was picked up by the red, green and blue photocells and the signal off went to the receiver. Not very high resolution, but it was colour and it was the first. He did persevere with um, colour and this is his 1937 camera. Uh, this is after he lost the competition uh, with electronic television uh, with the BBC. And um, this was demonstrated um, at the Dominion Theatre on a large screen. The line standard uh, was much better than it was, but not what we're used to today. It was 120 lines at six times interlace. So he sent the red picture, the green picture, the red picture, the green picture, and the blue picture sequentially. And this sequential business was one of the big snags with early colour television. This is a 1940 camera by the Canadian, sorry, Colombian Broadcasting System. It's electronic, the tube is in there. The other lens is for the optical viewfinder. And this one ran at three times two hundred and two and a half lines at 72 frames per second. The frame rate had to be high to get over the flicker. And one of the great problems was this, was it was non-standard. It was much higher frame rate than the black and white sets of the time, so the colour pictures could not be displayed on a black and white television. And this is how he did it. There was a coloured drum inside the camera which rotated and presented the three coloured filters in turn uh, to the tube. And this is the other end. Of course, this is pre-shadow mask. There were no colour television tubes to be had, so you had a black and white tube with a rotating colour filter in front of it. And this is the block diagram of the, the overall system. So that's the camera, and that's the receiver. You notice they've left out the interesting bit in the middle. <coughs> And this line is here, standard except for new line and field rates. <coughs> Back home, uh, post-war, um, everybody was interested in colour. And here is an early EMI camera. And you can see that the colour wheel is in the disc there. This is a surviving colour wheel from the period and you can clearly see the three coloured um, segments and the decay of the years. Pi had a go as well, the same system, uh, a rotating colour wheel and that camera is based on their uh, black and white Mark III camera. But there was still this problem of incompatibility you could not display these high frame rate pictures on a standard black and white TV and nobody really wanted to know. <coughs> so what to do about it? Well, here is a standards converter. <laughs> well, it's desperate. So you have three CRTs, one for each colour, and three cameras, and they're monochrome cameras because um, you take the, the 
uh, they're effectively taking the red, green and blue pictures and it's three monochrome cameras with the red, green and blue signals on them which went off to the coder or whatever. And of course the coder's another problem, they haven't been invented yet. <laughs> Here's another view of the, the gadget and to give you some idea of the problems, we all know about a, um, a colour tube, you have to register it or converge it. So you see the coils around there those are the convergence adjustments to bend the picture on the CRTs so that they're all in the same place. And not only that, you've got the up and down and the sideways and the to and fro, it's a mechanical nightmare. And you can see by the size of it that it would be very reasonably priced, sir. <coughs> About this time in America, CBS we saw earlier, um, were slogging it out with RCA over the choice of the best colour system. We've all heard of NTSC, and it stands for the National Television Standards Committee, not never twice the same colour. <coughs> anyway, Marconi had a go at it, they took a different approach. There's their camera, actually uh, out doing an OB, it's a closed circuit job and there's a standard black and white tube in the bottom and an additional colour tube at the top and the colour tube is the first example of what we call a stripey tube with stripes on the face plate to generate the colour so that was a two colour camera a, a two tube camera so here we have the fully mechanical system with the rotating disc, the pickup tube, the transmission channel and the reproduction. Alas, the high frame rate makes it non-standard and we've seen the standard converter which was employed to get it back to the standard black and white field rate. This is the simultaneous system where you have three tubes which we're sort of used to today and three display tubes. The shadow mass tube hasn't been invented yet, it's still a twinkle in RCA's eye. While we're on this slide we'll just look at the two there, that's a, a sequential system and a simultaneous system with frequency mixing or coding, they still don't know how to do it, and a transmission channel. The difference is of course that um, that's sequential, the pictures are going down red, green and blue and this one is going down in a, a combined form. Do you remember the three colour displays and the lack of a colour tube? Well this BBC built this, it's an experimental uh, colour display and it's got three tubes in it and an optical system to combine them together. They only ever built one. <coughs> nope. But essentially, if you think about the um, projector display that we used to see in the pubs where it was screwed to the ceiling and it had three tubes on it, and it's essentially the same thing. So it wasn't that far out, it was just a bit big. Now back in the States, the competition between uh, CBS and RCA was finally settled. The NTSC committee uh, settled on the RCA system, which was fully compatible with black and white. And this is the RCA camera. It's a three tube camera. It uses three image orphican tubes. It's a big camera. And um, this is the Marconi equivalent made in the UK, also three tubes. And what the Marconi and RCA did for these very first cameras, they took three black and white cameras and welded them together. And you'll see that there are three camera cables. So there are three sets of CCUs and three sets of power supplies. You can imagine how big and convenient it was. <coughs> Ah. 
that's one of the tubes. It is a photograph of an actual tube that was used in that actual camera. The camera doesn't survive, but the tube did. And it's a fairly big tube. I've got one on display out in the computer room. Uh, but that's its yoke. That's the scanning yoke. There were three of those in the camera, plus an optical splitter system. That's the, uh, the yoke. And that's the optical splitter system. The lens assembly is out there. The light comes in here through an iris uh, uh, driven by this motor. Uh, there's a prism there that separates the light into the primary colours. And that is then deflected off down three ports into the three tubes in their three yokes. So all this made for a very big, heavy and expensive camera. And to give you an idea, uh, here is one of those cameras. You can get an idea of the scale of it by the operator behind it. And that's out on an experimental um, colour <coughs> OB. Well, what to do about this size problem and the cost problem? Well, here's a Vidicon tube. We've all seen these. It's much smaller, but unfortunately the pictures aren't as good. It suffers from a number of deficiencies, lag, to name one of them. So the manufacturers at this time could see that colour broadcasting was coming. It's the late 50s. Everybody's talking about colour broadcasting starting, but the broadcasters are going, oh, God, it's expensive, big and heavy. And the manufacturers are going, oh, we don't know how to do it. Well, not at a price. So that's the tube which they cast their eyes on. And this is a camera that uses three of those tubes. <coughs> it's the EMI 204. It was widely used for industrial and medical purposes. Its performance was sub-broadcast. You would not be pleased, even in 1950 standards, with the pictures it produced. They were coloured but that's all you could really say for them. And for medical, of course, colour is important. So what to do? Well, EMI had a little head scratch, and they thought, well, perhaps if we take the best bits of a black and white camera and the best bits of the previous colour camera and stick them together to make a four-tube camera, that's one for the luminance, using a big tube with good quality, and just colour the pictures with the three uh, Vidicon tubes. And this is an experimental camera that EMI made to test the system. They never marketed it, they just wanted to see how it worked. But over in the US, <coughs> RCA developed a similar camera, uh, and they actually made them. They were very successful, they worked. But it's big and complex, not as big and complex as the, four, the three image Orphican tube camera. Down the middle of the camera is the lens assembly, and at the back the light is split 50-50. That way it goes to the luminance tube, and this way it comes to the light splitter there for the red, green and blue tubes. And it was a very plausible camera. Uh, the BBC went to the States to have a look and uh, appraise it in 1964. And their report, number T134, is on the internet if you want to <laughs> hear what the BBC had to say about it. And largely they said, well, it would do. It had a snag. It was, the complete system was $70,000. That's in 1964, and I did a back of the envelope calculation, and that comes out at about £300,000 in today's money. So there was a lot of pondering about this as what to do. It's, it's a bit of a problem. <coughs> That's uh, Marconi's uh, latest development of the free tube camera. It's their production model. They built it, they sold it. It went into industrial and um, uh, medical use. 
they built OB vans with them in. It wasn't really broadcast because this is 1962 and colour hadn't started in the UK but it would it would have been broadcast it was per pictures were perfectly acceptable but big heavy expensive but they had got it down to a single cable with only 101 wires in it <laughs> well philip stepped into the arena at this point and in this picture you can see a little camera there quite dinky even by today's standards. <clears throat> and in this shot you get a better idea of the size. There's the Philips camera, there's the Marconi uh, free image Orphican tube and they're on uh, test at a BBC test studio for evaluation. This is an experimental camera, it was never produced and marketed but its purpose was to test the new tube that Philips had developed this fella. This is a plumbicum, or, or more technically correct, it's a lead oxide vidicum. It's very similar in, to that fella there, except at the front it's got, instead of a, having antinium trisulfide, it's got a lead oxide. And a lot of the problems that the vidicum had had gone away. It wasn't laggy, the disc at the front is an anti-reflection uh, disc, anti-halogen, hey, uh, just, just stick with um, anti-reflection. <laughs> <coughs> well, everybody looked at this tube and went, gosh, this is it. So Philips was first off the blocks with their PC60 camera, two camera cables, well, th that wasn't too much of a problem because they're two black and white camera cables and the broadcasters were knee-deep in them at the time, so wasn't too much of a problem. And here it is. I don't know if you recognise the background, but that's Wimbledon. Uh, the BBC um, bought a number of these cameras. They bought three outside broadcast fans using them. Marconi was only slightly behind um, producing in 1965 the Marconi Mark 7. This is a four tube camera harking back to the idea that EMI had a separate luminance tube so there's a luminance tube in there and three colouring uh, plumbicons. Worked very well. If A lot of people thought they were unreliable but um, at the time they were pretty good, they were viable the control equipment was merely big and heavy. I want you to note at this point the distance between the turning axis, the panning axis of the camera and the front of the lens. Because of that distance being moderately large, when you pan you get a sort of crabbing action and the cameraman didn't like this, but they did like this. Uh, this is um, Mr. EMI's offering in 1966, a year later, the EMI 2001, a four tube camera but a completely different design inside and the lens front is there and the turning axis is there so it's much closer and the cameraman really liked that. I helped build the power supply. Did you? Mm. Ah. You've got a lot to answer for. <laughs> <laughs> well, not no. You could you could actually pick the power supply up. I can hold one like that. It was lighter than the Marconi one. So, the plumbicon tube went from strength to strength. Uh, they introduced separate mesh, light bias. They reduced the size first to twenty-five millimeters. They introduced something called HOP, or anti-comet tail. Um, you may recall, if your memory is long enough, when a colour camera was panning and there happened to be a bright light in the scene, you had a multicoloured trail after it. Uh, and HOP effectively got over that. It was a cunning idea. Um, the 
trail is caused by the target not being fully discharged by the scanning beam and over a number of scans it discharges that really bright spot and that's why you have the tail. Well some bright chap had the idea of why don't we during blanking when you're not using the scanning beam uh, defocus the beam turn the grid volts um, up and flood the target with electrons to discharge everything and that's what they did and that's um, anti-comet tail uh, or HOP, highlight overload protection depending on which manufacturer's book you're reading a WISO idea they also uh, introduced something called a diode gun uh, which again improved things and reduced the size still further to 18 millimeters and that really is the end of the tube story um, it wasn't long before RCA developed the CCD chip uh, and we all know where that led so there we are thank you very much is there any questions <clears throat> Good.